Okay, this video is about chapter 11 from the book here, um, Medical Reformation, Vegan Renaissance Bible by me. Um, this chapter is about exercise. <clears throat> and so we start out by looking at the sea squirt. The sea squirt life cycle is interesting. As a juvenile, it swims around like a tadpole and it has a brain. In the adult phase, <clears throat> it attaches to a rock and then its brain is reabsorbed. It doesn't need a brain. If you're just going to be a filter feeder, and just in the same way, you don't need a brain if you sit on the couch like a couch potato. This also helps explain why exercise is one of the best things you can do to increase longevity and prevent dementia. The human brain has about 100 billion neurons, and about 70 billion, 70% 70 of those neurons are in your cerebellum, the little thing in the back. And the relevance is that it has a bunch of short interneurons for coordinating fine motor movements, you know, like being able to write your name with a pen. And that's pretty relevant because, you know, you look at it like an animal like a chimpanzee. Chimpanzees are a lot stronger than us. They could, they could kick our ass in a fight, okay? But chimpanzees are much stupider than us. I actually think we're not anywhere near as related to them as people try to claim. Our, you know, supertentorial cerebral cortex is like three times bigger than theirs. Chimp can't even count, okay? But... Um, We've got much better hand fine coordination, you know, for things like, you know, writing with a pen and becoming literate and all that. The other thing is, when you think about the brain, the brain is much more for movement than it is for thinking. Uh, most of our brain resources are dedicated to movement and also to vision. Uh, if you remember, like, Moravec's paradox, that was the idea of you know, robots and computer programming, that it was easier to do the hard problem and then the simple problem was difficult in the sense that, what am I talking about? It was easy to make a computer back in like 1950s and 60s that could do calculus, which everybody thinks of as being difficult for the brain, but to actually move in a coordinated, smooth fashion. They're obviously getting better at it, but they still can't make something move as smooth and coordinated as a human. That takes a lot more neuron, neuron resources. You'll also see if you're reading a book and you start <clears throat> spacing out and you can't remember what you just read when you get to the bottom of the paragraph. If you stand up and walk and then start walking around, you'll find that you very often will get a sudden increased clarity of thought. Because, you know, what is the purpose of the brain? The purpose of the brain is to walk down a path in a forest or a jungle and to survive. The brain has to deal with reality. It tells you the truth. It doesn't go along with every latest social trend or, or fad. Um, so when an animal encounters a new environment, it must very quickly learn that environment. Otherwise, it'll die. So that's why you get this heightened alertness when you're moving. Because for an animal, that meant moving in the environment. Okay. Um, so here's the quote by Voltaire. Why do animals have brains but plants do not? Because animals move. Oh yeah, as soon as you as soon as you move, you need to you need to use a brain because you have to make a value judgment. You have to decide I shall go over there towards where the food is, the fruit tree. I shall avoid danger over there, a bunch of coyotes. Um, you have to navigate to the destination. You have to avoid obstacles in the path. You have to have a memory to remember how to get back where you came from. Um, so it takes a lot of cognitive resources and physical resources for movement and coordination to do that. Okay, um, when you exercise, you get increased secretion of something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, and that helps new neurons to grow. So when you learn something, you get one thing called synaptogenesis to form new synapses and to modify synapses. Synapses are the connections between brain cells, but you will also form new neurons, and that takes you into, you know, how does the brain map cognitive space? Cognitive space means thinking and learning. Why, how does the brain... Uh, organize that. And the way to think of it is like a scaffold. Whenever you learn something new, you have to connect it to what's already in your brain. And it begins right from the baby. You know, mama and papa come into the room. They give baby the bottle, the baba. Okay, so baby got the baba and the baby notices. How long does it take when mama and papa enter that door of the baby's bedroom till they get to the bed, give it the baba? How much time and effort does it take to lift the baba to the mouth, the bottle? Okay, so what I'm saying is that they're calibrating and learning everything as they go, and all the new information is just added on to that. So <clears throat> it's by comparisons, by metaphors, analogies, similes that we figure out and learn all the new stuff. That is a dog because it goes, you know, bow wow. That is a cat because it goes meow. And all the knowledge that you have inside your brain is this giant scaffold to connect and add new things. Sometimes just a modification of a synapse for a small learning thing. Perhaps you need a new neuron to uh, add in a more complex thought. 
And um, that's how we map cognitive thought. And the more you want to remember something long term, like let's say you're studying for school, the first thing you would do is ask yourself, okay, what am I learning here? What is the significance? What is it like? What is it not like? And then ask yourself, will I remember this a week from now, a year from now, five years from now? The more important it is, the more you should make sure that you did, you connected it to something else in your head already that enables you to uh, remember it long term. Okay, so a synapse can be made stronger, you know, to increase the the resilience of a memory trace, like a pathway of neurons that retrieve a certain piece of knowledge. Um, let's see, what else is in here? Okay, so forming new neurons is called neurogenesis, you know. Glycogen storage, the brain does store some glycogen. It's called glycogen supercompensation in the brain, especially in the astrocytes, it'll store some glycogen. Not a whole lot, but at least there's some. You'll notice your study endurance increases, like if you're in grad school or something from the first couple months by you know the second year you can study much longer and more intensely um, let's see you also get mitochondrial biogenesis so mitochondria the ATP makers the energy makers you form new ones with exercise so the same thing exercise and using your muscles and using your brain think about it in animals they, they go together and in humans they're much more connected than we widely give them credit for um, but that's all good so you're making that makes the brain more resilient when it's got more mitochondria because the brain's exposed to a lot of excitotoxins that increase cytoplasm calcium and you need to make a lot of ATP to pump that calcium out of the cytoplasm. I'm going to go into this more later, but you're always pumping calcium against a gradient because the extracellular matrix has like 15,000 times more calcium concentration than does the cytoplasm. And the point of that is you always need ATP uh, to generate the energy to pump against the gradient. And that means you need mitochondria. And the relevance here is if you're making more mitochondria, you got more ability to produce ATP to pump that calcium out versus if you're eating, let's say, processed food with all these preservatives on it, like fungal inhibitors, which are often mitochondria inhibitors, then you're going to have less ability to pump out the calcium, meaning less ability to resist the harmful effects of excitotoxins. You know, things like glutamate, manufactured free glutamate, monosodium glutamate, caffeine, glyphosate on your, you know, your soy and your other non-organic foods. Okay, exercise increases a good type of angiogenesis. So you'll form more blood vessels on the surface of the brain and inside the brain parenchyma in response to exercise. I can also tell you, I look at tons of brains, and you'll often see very highly vascular brain when you're looking at, like, say, a 30-year-old. Um, and then when you're looking at the brain of, like, a 70-year-old and 80-year-old, there's much fewer blood vessels all over the surface of the brain. So the brain is largely in our body as well. Use it or lose it. You need to keep on using your brain a lot, both by exercising a lot <clears throat> and by doing cognitively challenging things, whatever that is for you, having intelligent conversations, uh, reading books, whatever it is, um, that will maintain better uh, blood supply to your brain. You'll keep your smarts a lot longer. Okay. And you also want to maintain good insulin sensitivity, which means you eat a low-fat diet is the primary thing, plus the plant foods. You get the right amounts of potassium and sodium because the point of that is it used to be they thought, oh, insulin doesn't matter for the brain. The brain is not affected by insulin resistance. But actually it is because there's glucose type 4 transporters in your hippocampus and in other important areas of your brain. And so they're also going to develop insulin resistance in response to high-fat diets, for example. Um, and the substantia nigra has that as well within the uh, midbrain, which is relevant to Parkinson's disease. So a low-fat diet is protective of the brain in that way. Um, exercise tones up your body, your muscles, it improves your physical appearance. And when your physical appearance is improved from exercise, that raises your self-esteem. Um, measures of good physical fitness, things like grip strength, exercise capacity, they're correlated with living longer, you know, and the so-called health span, how long we live that we're healthy, not just the lifespan, how many years we live in total. Um, <clears throat> exercise helps to activate the maintenance pathways in your cells that improves cellular function like the AMPK pathway. So the important thing about the AMPK pathway is that basically it's the restoration pathway. It's sort of the opposite of mTOR. Think of them as like a, as like a seesaw. mTOR is mammalian target of rapamycin. It's a nutrient sensing pathway. It's like a contractor getting ready to build a building and it can't build until all the building materials are available. The rate limiting step tends to be leucine, an amino acid more common in animal foods, but also iron, 
more common in animal foods, and um, fat, like especially sat fat as well. So what I'm trying to say here is that when you exercise a lot, you activate the AMPK pathway, what's the opposite? So mTOR pathway says we got lots of nutrients, it's a good time to grow, it's a good time for the cell to replicate. If you're over you know, 30 years of age, you don't want increased cell replication. That could be speeding up um, the growth of cancer, that could also be speeding up uh, accelerating aging. The non-stem cells in your body, they're called somatic cells, som soma means body, they basically, you typically can divide about 60 times. After, and they shorten a little bit with each cell division because uh, DNA polymerase to make copies of the chromosomes at cell division, it can't uh, recreate the end of the chromosome. So it's always shortening with each cell division. And eventually by around 60 cell divisions, it's shortening into essential genes that you need for that cell to live and function. So the point of all this is that if you're activating mTOR all the time, you're accelerating, your, you're accelerating cell replication leading to earlier arrival at the Hayflick limit. That's when the cells die, okay? So what I'm saying is AMPK pathway is the opposite. It says, hey, we just exercised, we're low in ATP, we're low in energy. Now is not a good time for replicating or building anything. Now is a good time to just rest, restore ourselves, regenerate some ATPs, okay? And when you're a little bit energy depleted, you'll also go through something called mitophagy whereby the cell will check all its mitochondria and try to make sure that they're all functioning well. So the cell doesn't want to mess around. It's like get your act together time, and that helps to maintain healthy cells. I think your ancestors, you know, they had to exercise a lot, and they often had times when they weren't, you know, full on three high-fat meals a day. Okay, so this was basically the, the seesaw that I was just talking about. So, and by the way, if you want any of these slides, just, you know, hit the little button there, the print screen button that's just like P-R-T-S-C-N. It's typically above the, you know, insert thing, above the delete key and all the arrow keys on your typical keyboard. So the point is, you just click that button and you can get a copy of the slide. You can keep your own file of slides. Um, all right, so here's your seesaw. The growth pathway that, that uh, a lot of Westerners spend too much time in. Uh, with activation of mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. Sometimes they'll call it mechanistic target of rapamycin. High fat diets, you get elevated blood insulin, hyperinsulinemia because of the insulin resistance. Typically the patients are fat. Um, there's often have insomnia, elevated cortisol because of that. They typically are eating a lot of animal food. This is all stuff you don't want to do. Elevate your insulin-like growth factor. Estrogenic chemicals are weight gain uh, chemicals, fat storage hormones like store this extra weight fat for the baby, might need it for energy. Excessive dietary sodium also wor worsens this. Sweets uh, can potentially worsen it. Sweets are a little complicated. We'll talk about that in the future, but they're more complicated. But anyways, for maintenance, when you exercise, you uh, put yourself into this restoration phase where the cell says, look, we're a little low on uh, energy. We need to restore things. We can't be uh, dividing right now. So for a cell to divide and replicate itself it takes tons of energy and a lot of effort because it has to make a copy. You've got 3.3 billion base pairs in the chromosome of every cell. So that's a lot of synthesis, a lot of nucleotides to make. Plus, you have to make all these membranes so the cell can double itself. Um, so that takes a lot of energy, a lot of resources. All right, so anyways, you want to spend more time in the maintenance phase. That's a key point. You know, if you're a 40-year-old, 20-year-old bodybuilder trying to get big muscles real fast, then more animal protein, more activation of mTOR might be what you want at that age. But for the rest of us, you don't want that. For the rest of us, you want to slow down mTOR. You want to slow down the arrival at the Hayfla Clinic, that 60 cell divisions, because, you know, cells die after that. Yeah, because every time you're shortening the telomerase, telomerase, well, the telomeres are like uh, little plastic caps around the tip of a shoelace. Telomerase is an enzyme that can maintain those little plastic caps at the tip of the shoelace, so to speak. The shoelace here being a metaphor for the chromosomes. And the point I'm saying is normally the cell shortens a little bit, shortens through that little shoelace cap and keeps on going down into the rest of the chromosome until by about 60 cell divisions, it's destroying genes that that cell needs just to live. So yeah, basically AM, AMPK tells the cell we are tired, okay? We just need to restore ourselves, generate more ATP. We need to focus on restoring ATP levels. Oh, so I just added a couple things in this slide compared to the other one. Other things associated with increased aging and death are 
all these excitotoxins, nitric oxide inhibitors, circa inhibitors, mitochondrial toxins, all of that stuff is pushing you in a bad direction, accelerating your aging, damaging your cell function, these heavy metals as well. Okay, the things that are helping you are all the stuff we talked about, you know, the plant foods, getting your sleep, you know, managing your stress too. Things that help you manage your stress is social support, friends, pleasant constant conversations, family, religion. People in all the major religions, they're all a lot healthier than all the secular or atheist people. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that's, that's proven that. And it just makes sense logically because um, they have a better sense of hope, a better sense of purpose and meaning in their life. Okay. Uh, oh, this is just a nice painting here. This is a painting by Thomas Cole. And I think Thomas Cole is the greatest story painter who ever lived. Of course, Michelangelo is a pretty great story painter as well. But I love this series of paintings. There's four paintings. So here's the first one by Thomas Cole. It's from 1842, The Voyage of Life series. And the cave sort of mimics, of course, the woman's birth canal. And the baby comes out. The baby's with mama. Everything is happy and abundant and positive. And then the next phase in the voyage of life is the young man, okay, or the young woman. And basically young people, they're very gung-ho. They've got a clear vision usually of what they want for their future. And with vigor, they pursue the, their, their dream in the sky where they're heading. And everything looks like a straight path up to paradise to, you know, everything being perfect. And there's Mama on the shore waving bye-bye to the young guy. And he's not even looking at Mama. He's so confident. He's so motivated. He's so eager. Okay, but I love the reality of this painting. You see this straight path going up to pie in the sky. But then you look at the, at the river and it takes a big turn. And then as the river takes its turn, it starts heading for the rapids. And that's a lot of times what life is like. It's not just this cakewalk party. I wish it was. And then here's a common situation we find ourselves in. So here's middle age. And uh, in this painting, you can see now he's a middle-aged man. And he's in his boat, but he's lost his oars. He's heading over the rapids where there's a bunch of rocks. He's afraid he's going to crash. Mama, the guardian angel, is farther away. And if you look real close at this painting, there's almost like sort of these almost demon-like faces in the clouds. And there's a big storm brewing. It's kind of scary. And a lot of us go through some difficult times like that in middle age. And in this case, the context of this lecture, you know, getting sick. A lot of people, you know, they, when you're young, you got a lot more physiologic reserve and you can handle crazy behavior like staying up late, drinking, and, you know, going to work early the next day. But when you get older, you got to take good care of yourself because you're more fragile. Otherwise, you run into a lot of health problems. But a lot of people get sick for the first time in middle age. Plus, you, you're not sleeping as well. You, let's say you're married, you have a baby, you're up at night trying to you know, keep things good with the baby. Or let's say you get divorced, that causes a ton of stress. All of these things make it more difficult to optimize stress. So you got to be more efficient with your time and more knowledgeable about how to optimize your health to stay healthy through middle age and as one gets older. Okay, so here's the picture four of four from the Voyage of Life series with Thomas Cole. And in this one, this one's called Old Age. And you can see in Old Age here, it shows the waters are now peaceful and the old man is looking up into the sky. The guardian angel is sort of pointing the direction. There's another angel up there in the sky heading towards heaven. So everything is kind of blissful, serene, peaceful, and nice. And that's nice. But we spent a long time in middle age, okay? And it can be pretty difficult. So that's kind of the purpose of this book, to help you navigate. I also think middle age is where we typically have the best chance to help somebody. In my experience, uh, young people are tend to be kind of cocky and they'll just ignore you, you know. I sometimes lift weights with young guys and, you know, it's hard to get them to take any advice. They're always taking some protein supplement or other nonsense from some, uh, you know, BS artist just trying to sell them stuff. If you go to Consumer Reports, you'll see there's a lot of, quite often, heavy metal contaminations in a lot of these protein supplements. I would never take one of those things. They're harsh on the kidney. Plus, the more you process something and make it into powder, for example, the higher the manufactured free glutamate is in there, meaning the more of a neurotoxic effect. Plus, you superimpose on that heavy metal toxins like so many of them have. They're bad for your brain. 
Okay, but what I'm saying is in middle age and old age too, a lot of patients, they're just setting their ways. You know, I had lots of patients tell me, oh, doc, I'd rather die than stop eating meat or, you know, they, their joy of life. You know, they say things to me like, oh, you're going to take away my ice cream? You know, I'm like, look, I'm trying to help you. Um, so anyways, in middle age, you got a better chance typically in my experience of getting a patient to actually want to learn and be willing to change their behavior and their diet and whatnot. Okay, so that's all I got for exercise. I guess I would just say a few things more about exercise. I think isometrics are better than people give them credit for. Um, I think a good way to exercise is to just make it part of your routine, like park far when you go to the store, park far when you go to work, when you have to go to the bathroom at work or at home, go to the bathroom on a different floor that's farthest away. Uh, you can have little weights in your room. Um, I'll sometimes have little weights that I'll carry around, like doing a bear walk to carry the, the stuff around. If no one's home when I eat dinner, I'll sometimes walk around in circles around the house and play an audio book because they're three different things. Number one, hearing the audio book, that's a cognitive activity. Number two, um, when I'm eating, that's sort of a visceral activity. Your viscera is like your internal organs. And number three, Walking is a musculoskeletal activity. So you can do three separate system activities all at the same time pretty easily. That would be like, you know, walking on a on a treadmill while you're, you know, talking on the phone or, or doing something on the computer. You could you could do that, but you can't do two things at the same time with the same system. You know, you can't read something and then listen to a lecture at the same time. You can only do one or the other. Um, but those are some ways to, to get more exercise into your day. If you have a choice, take the stairs instead of elevators, okay? You know, whenever I've ever worked in hospitals, um, I always would take the stairs to get a lot more exercise, and everybody should, and I always find that funny. Any hospital I've ever worked in, hardly anybody takes the stairs. So all these people are in healthcare and should really know this sort of thing. It's pretty obvious. It's a way to get a free health club, but they hardly ever do. Uh, anyways, uh, let's see, what else is a good thing? I try to lift weights at least once a week, if not twice a week. Um, anyways, hope that helps.